Chapter 28 The Reproductive System We want to start by looking at a fetus that is sexually undifferentiated, and this means that we do not yet know whether it will become male or female. We cannot tell based on the anatomy. The anatomy is still in the very early stages, and internally, what we see, and this is at around five to six weeks, is when the gonads start to, to develop, but internally what we have are two sets of ducts that are right next to each other. And basically what's going to happen is, is that one of these ducts will remain while the other one degenerates. And if we end up being male, it will be the Wolfian duct that remains. And if we end up becoming female, it will be the Mullerian duct that remains. And the other one will degenerate. Now, this is orchestrated by the DNA, by the genetics. And let's recall that a male is going to have an XY um, sex chromosome. It'll have one X and one Y. And a female will have an X and an X. The X chromosome is larger than the Y. The Y is smaller. But on the Y, there is a gene called the SRY gene which stands for sex determining of the Y. And it's only found on the Y chromosome, which means only in males. And this SRY gene codes for a protein that's called testes determining factor. And this initiates the development of testes. And so the way to think about this is that the gonads, when the fetus is undifferentiated, the gonads will be in the abdomen. And we know that in females, the gonads are in the abdomen, that is the ovaries are in the abdomen. But in males, the gonads are external to the abdomen. And so basically the way to think about this is that the SRY gene is going to orchestrate these testes to start to secrete testosterone around eight to nine weeks. The uh, Wolfian ducts are the ones that remain. The Mullerian ducts are inhibited and will degenerate. And the gonads will descend out of the abdomen and into a scrotum. An interesting fact about this is that because estrogen levels are always high in pregnancy, if it were estrogen that was the hormone that directed female development, all fetuses would be female. But it really is going to be testosterone and the presence of testosterone that does this. And that's going to be from the SRY gene. And so basically, the absence of testosterone or of an androgen hormone is what gives us the female characteristic and the presence of the androgen testosterone gives us the male characteristic. Now here is a view of this differentiation and we want to start with the five to six week embryo which is undifferentiated. We cannot tell yet whether it will become male or female. And what we want to see is that you've got this mesonephric duct, which is this light blue one, which is going to end up becoming the Wolfian duct if it remains. And right next to it, you've got this paramesonephric, 
duct or the mullerian, which is this uh, purple one. And that's going to remain if we end up becoming female. So one of these will remain and the other one will degenerate. Now, if we, if we go this way and we look at the male, what we see is that, in fact, the mullerian duct starts to break down. The wolfian duct remains, but not only that, if we see that the bladder's position is right here at seven to eight weeks, we can see the positioning of the future testes that are in the abdomen above the bladder, but we see that at birth, the testes have descended out of the abdomen and into the scrotum. If we look at the female, we see that the ovaries are above the bladder, of course, and that in this case, the uh, mullerian duct will remain and the wolfian duct will degenerate. And let's think about what these tubes turn into. So if we look at the male on this side first, we see that this tube ends up becoming the ductus deferens, which is the tube that transports sperm from the testes to the urethra. And in the female, we see that that duct, the mullerian duct, turns into the uterine tube, otherwise known as the fallopian tube, which is the tube that brings the egg to the uterus. So this gives us a sense that there are these structures that are related to each other from this fetus that is not differentiated yet to the male characteristic or the female characteristic. And so we can call these structures homologous to each other. And these structures that are homologous to each other, there's a table here that shows us that, for example, and we saw it in the previous picture, that the ovaries are indeed homologous to the testes. We also can think about the cells that are made within the ovaries. The ovum, or the egg, is going to be therefore homologous to the sperm cells that are made inside the testes. The labia majora will be homologous to the scrotum. And you can read through these yourselves. Um, the clitoris, homologous to the glands penis. The periurethral glands in the female, homologous to the prostate. And so all of these, the anatomy, if you think about it, it all starts looking the same. And then, of course, it changes to either have the male characteristic or the female characteristic. So this picture shows us that we have the six week old fetus that is not differentiated yet. We cannot yet tell what this reproductive anatomy is gonna end up being. At eight weeks, it starts to develop and then we can either go to the left or to the right. And basically it's color coded for you so that you can follow what will become what, and so that this labioscrotal fold, for example, in blue, if you follow it, right, you can see that it will turn into the scrotum in the male, or it will turn into the labia in the female. And you can do this for all the other structures as well. Let's look at a clinical view of the intersex condition. And this is a condition where basically both male and female characteristics 
are, are present. Now, true gonadal intersects, where you truly have both male and female reproductive parts that are viable for reproduction, this is extremely rare. And so we don't refer to this very much simply because it is a condition that we rarely see. However, pseudo hermaphroditism, which appears to be uh, a hermaphrodite but is not, hence the term pseudo, can happen when genetically the person is either male or female, but the appearance is not what the genetics states. So let's start by looking at 46 XY intersects. And the number 46 tells you that there are 46 chromosomes. The X and the Y are the sex chromosomes. So in this case, we have a male because of the Y chromosome. Genetically, it's a male, but the external genitalia resemble a female. And so let's ask ourselves first how this could happen. We said that the absence of androgens or testosterone gives us the female phenotype or appearance. And so this can happen from a reduction or lack of male hormones during development. So lack of testosterone, lack of being able pr to produce testosterone. Or think about it this way, every hormone needs a receptor. So the other possibility here would be that the receptor for testosterone is either not being made properly or inactive. And so even if testosterone is being produced, the receptor for testosterone is not, which means there is no testosterone effect and you end up getting female characteristics. The second type is this 46XX intersex. So again, 46 chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are X and X, meaning that it is a genetic female, but we have the external genitalia resembling a male. So for example, the clitoris can be enlarged, the labia are partially fused. And so when we look at it, it looks like a penis and a scrotum. Now this can happen, and if we remember that the presence of testosterone slash androgens give us the male phenotype or appearance, then this would happen if the fetus is exposed to excessive androgens. Now let's think about where this could happen in the female, right? Because if we don't have testes, because we are genetically a female, so we don't have testes, the question is where are these androgens coming from? Well, the most common location for this is the adrenal gland. And if you recall from chapter 18 on the endocrine chapter, the adrenal gland had in its cortex a section that was making androgens. And the, this is where the androgens are produced in females that eventually, for the most part, get converted to estrogen. But in hyperplasia, meaning excessive production of these hormones, they end up circulating more and more. And so basically, even though genetically we have a female, the appearance or the phenotype is that of a male. Let's look at the male reproductive system. So what we wanna see here is first the anatomy. And let's look at this part right here. These are called the seminiferous tubules. And so you can see that they are a repeating unit. Those are seminiferous tubules. These are seminiferous tubules and these are seminiferous tubules and so on and so on. All of these are seminiferous tubules. Now, if you notice, 
they all seem to bring their contents, because they're going to be making sperm, right? So that's where the sperm production is. They're all bringing their contents to this center spot right here that is called the rete testis. And the rete testis then will end up bringing that sperm to the epididymis for storage. This right here is the epididymis. And the sperm cells will remain there until ejaculation takes place. And when that happens, the sperm get brought into the ductus or the vas deferens, which is this tube right here, which if you follow it, it'll go into a part of the male reproductive anatomy called the spermatic cord. Now notice that there's a lot going on with the spermatic cord because you also have blood vessels and nerves that run through there. You also have uh, musculature that goes through that spermatic cord, but also importantly, you have the vas deferens for sperm uh, transportation. So when the male hits puberty, what's gonna happen is, is that these seminiferous tubules activate to be able to make sperm. And the process that we're gonna to use to do this is called meiosis. And with meiosis, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna start with a primary spermatocyte. And this primary spermatocyte, which is 2N, meaning that the DNA is all there, uh, that is typically found in regular body cells, divides in meiosis one to make secondary spermatocytes that are now N each. Each one is just N. And that just means that the DNA has been separated into two different cells. Now, if you wanna look at the details of this meiosis process, uh, there, there are those details in, in the early chapters, but we, we can't go through all of that. We just have to know at this point that these cells divide again in a process called meiosis II. And when that happens, you end up getting what we call spermatids, which basically are gonna turn into the sperm cells but are not differentiated yet to look like sperm cells. So they, the DNA within them is the DNA that's gonna end up being in the sperm cells, but we have to go through a process called spermiogenesis, which is the process of differentiating these cells to look like sperm cells. In other words, with the acrosome head and the tail that is a flagellum that allows for that cell to swim, all that differentiation takes place within the seminiferous tubules, and this is called spermiogenesis. Now at this point, once, if we look at the appearance of these cells, they look like sperm cells, we call them spermatozoa. And all of this is happening inside the lumen of those seminiferous tubules. In other words, the lumen is the inside of the tube of of these seminiferous tubules. This right here is a seminiferous tubule that we've sliced through, and we're looking at it under an electron microscope. And then within here is the tubule of it. So these are the cells that are gonna be doing the meiosis. And what's gonna happen is, Meiosis takes place and the cells start moving from the outside of this tubule towards the lumen as this process takes place. So you can think about primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermatid, and then once we get to here, we're gonna turn into spermatozoa. And in fact, this part right here is showing you those flagella of several spermatozoa 
within that seminiferous tubule. So what are interstitial cells? Interstitial cells are the cells that are going to be found in between seminiferous tubules, and they are being highlighted right here in this light blue on that side and on this side. If we look at the picture on the right, it's actually the same picture, but we're using a light microscope, so there's a bit less detail going on here, but the idea is the same. We're doing meiosis, and here you can really see the DNA and the chromosomes that are getting shuffled around and split into various cells, but we're moving in this direction from the outside towards the inside of this seminiferous tubule until we make our way into the lumen, and that's where the sperm, uh, the spermatozoa, will have differentiated. But again, what you want to see here is in between these seminiferous tubules, you have cells called interstitial cells. Now, the reason why these are important physiologically is because those are the cells that will be making testosterone in the male. So it's not the sperm cells that make testosterone. The sperm cells are affected by testosterone, but it is instead the interstitial cells that will be making testosterone. So let's see how these interstitial cells produced testosterone. Some of this will be review. We have the hypothalamus that is making gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH. This GnRH goes to the anterior pituitary and tells the anterior pituitary to produce LH and FSH. And both of these hormones get secreted out. And basically, FSH is the hormone that causes the testes to activate for the production of sperm cells. So follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates the follicles, or you can think about the seminiferous tubules. We're talking about the spermatogenic cells, in other, ones, in other words, the ones that are doing the meiosis and the uh, differentiation to spermatozoa to basically make these uh, sperm cells. The LH, on the other hand, is going to travel to those interstitial cells, and these interstitial cells will be the ones that secrete testosterone. And testosterone, once it's manufactured, will do several things. One thing it's going to do is it will actually also stimulate those spermatogenic cells to make and differentiate sperm cells. But also, we know that testosterone ends up giving us the male pattern of development, not only before birth, but during puberty and afterwards, and enlargement of male sex organs, expression of male secondary sex characteristics. So for example, a larger body stature, more muscle, deeper voice, all of that, and anabolism, which is just protein Synthesis, and this tells you something about when you hear people refer to anabolic steroids, what they're referring to are the steroids that cause protein growth or growth of organs such as uh, muscle growth. And that's what uh, can be used, for example, in order to increase muscle mass. So what else? Well, if we look at this, this has to be a classic negative feedback loop because we need to be able to shut this down. And so whenever you see a dotted line, you will see that a dotted line inhibits. So first of all, the area where the spermatogenic cells are will also be making a hormone called inhibin. And it's called inhibin, of course, because it inhibits. So it can go back and slow down the production of the FSH. The testosterone can go back with that dotted line and inhibit the production of LH. 
It can also go all the way back to the hypothalamus where this started and inhibit the production of GnRH. Let's look at some of the details of the male reproductive anatomy. And here what we're looking at is a posterior view. So to orient yourself, just realize that this right here is the hip bone and this is the urinary bladder. Here what you see, this tube is the vas deferens, which makes its way through um, that inguinal canal and it goes behind the bladder. And if you follow it this way, what you notice is that it gets a bit wider here. And we call that part of the vas deferens the ampulla of the vas deferens. And you can see that it's wider right there. And right next to that, you're gonna see a organ that secretes uh, seminal fluid and that's called the seminal vesicle. And also what you see are that these two end up meeting at this ejaculatory duct, which is basically a, a common tube that receives contents from both those areas. And this ejaculatory duct, that it goes into the prostate, which is this organ here. And at that point, what we get is this prostatic urethra and then after the prostatic urethra you get the membranous urethra which you can see is being sandwiched right there uh, between those muscles of the perineum and you also see those cowper's glands on either side of the urethra right there and then finally once we are um, in the penis it is called the spongy urethra, which is this one right here. The reason why it's called the spongy urethra is that this part of the penis is called the corpus spongiosum. Uh, it looks spongy, and so that's the term, and that part of the urethra is going straight through it. Okay, so we know that the vas deferens is transporting sperm. But we also need to have other contents. And so the seminal vesicles are important because they secrete an alkaline, viscous fluid containing fructose, which is going to be the food for these sperm cells as they swim, prostaglandins, which help them to be more motile, and also clotting proteins, which are important to make the sperm more effective once it is inside the uh, female reproductive tract. Secondly, the prostate will also secrete its own products. And here what we're gonna get is, from the prostate, we'll get a milky, slightly acidic fluid containing citric acid, uh, proteolytic enzymes, which help uh, basically break down uh, tissues further ahead so that these uh, sperm cells can basically try to uh, penetrate the egg, and also seminal plasmin, which has antimicrobial properties. So all of these contents will go into the ejaculatory duct, and once they all mix together, we call that semen. The other um, gland here, it's called the Cowper's gland or the bulbo urethral gland is going to be the one that makes pre-ejaculate, which helps with lubrication during intercourse. So now we're going to look at the female reproductive system, and we're going to start by looking at the ovary, and this is a microscope picture of it, and different parts of it are being highlighted for us. The first thing to notice is that on the outside or the cortex of this ovary, we have primordial follicles. And you can see that they are these very uh, small blue dots. These are small and still very underdeveloped. These are the future oocytes, 
that have not developed yet. What's going to happen is that every cycle, these will get larger as they develop. And when, when they first start getting larger, we call them primary follicles. And once they get much larger and filled with fluid inside a space called an antrum, we call them secondary follicles. And here you can really see how they're being filled with fluid right there. So this shows us how things move over time. And what you've got here is the primary follicles that are still small and haven't developed yet. Then you can see how they grow into primary follicles with more cells surrounding them. And then here you can see the secondary follicle. You can really see how it's filled with fluid and that follicular fluid is found within the antrum. Now at some point they get so large, right before ovulation, we call them mature or graphian follicles. The cells that are surrounding this oocyte are called the corona radiata because it looks like a crown. And if you look further down, you'll see that the uh, follicle ruptures, and that's basically the ovulation. And this oocyte gets ejected from the ovary to be accepted by the fallopian tube, which is then going to transport it to the uterus. Now, notice this corpus hemorrhagicum, which is the rest of it that did not get ejected out, that is still a very important structure which will turn into an endocrine secreting organ, which is going to be a temporary one, and it's going to be called the corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum will be important for the production of progesterone, and we're going to see how this happens in the ovarian cycle. If pregnancy does not take place, then what happens is that this corpus luteum rather quickly degenerates, and you can see it here, kind of shriveling up, getting smaller, and then develop, turns into a scarred tissue called the corpus albicans. The meiosis in females is rather different than meiosis in males. In males, meiosis does not begin until puberty, and then basically uh, an unlimited amount of sperm cells can be made. In females, it is different in the sense that meiosis begins in the fetal period. And so what we can see is that meiosis is in progress, and we see that these uh, two N cells pause in prophase one, which is one of the stages of meiosis one. They pause there, and when birth takes place, all of those primary oocytes are already there, and that's why we oftentimes hear that females are born with all of their eggs already in place, and in a sense, that is true. Now, childhood uh, before puberty, we see no development of, fo of follicles. Once puberty commences, what we see is that the cycles begin. And every cycle, several of these primary oocytes resume meiosis. And this is going to happen in both ovaries. And you'll have a handful of oocytes that do this although only one in the end is going to be ovulated every cycle, typically. So let's see what happens every cycle. This primary oocyte is still in prophase one, and it's still a primary follicle, but it starts to develop again, and it goes and becomes a secondary follicle. So this primary oocyte, then what's going to happen is we're going to see that it will do, it will complete meiosis one, and will start meiosis two. 
And this meiosis two will pause in metaphase two. And this is all within this mature follicle with that fluid filled antrum right there. Now at this point, meiosis may never actually finish. In fact, if fertilization does not take place, we're gonna stop in metaphase two and we're never gonna complete meiosis. However, if fertilization does take place, we can see the sperm cell right there. What's gonna happen is that um, this, this cell that's the polar body will split into two more polar bodies. And then the secondary oocyte will split into a third polar body and then an ovum, which is the one that's gonna have the DNA that's gonna mix with the sperm DNA to make the zygote. And this is typically going to take place inside the fallopian tubes. So let's look at that anatomy. So we know that ovulation takes place at the ovary and that the fallopian tubes receive the oocyte. This oocyte has to move through the fallopian tubes, which are ciliated, and sperm cells have to basically meet that oocyte somewhere inside the fallopian tube and what's going to happen is that fertilization takes place there and now we have this zygote that's going to start dividing into more cells with mitosis and this zygote that is dividing to eventually become a morula and then finally a blastocyst will end up going into the uterus and will look for the wall of the uterus to implant itself or to uh, make a little nest for itself. And we call that implantation. Once that happens, that's when we say that pregnancy has finally commenced. So here what we see are the cilia that are lining that uterine or fallopian tube. And so just remember that even though sperm are motile because of their flagella, oocytes are not. So we need another mechanism and we're gonna use cilia to move the oocyte from one end of the, fallopian, of the fallopian tube towards the uterus. And here is a good picture of those cilia over those simple columnar epithelial cells. And of course these will be uh, beating and moving in order to move the oocyte towards the uterus. For implantation to occur, the blastocyst has to find uh, the wall of the uterus. We call the wall of the uterus or the lining of the uterus where this blastocyst will try to implant we call that the endometrium. And beneath the endometrium is the muscle of the uterus, and we call the muscle of the uterus the myometrium. And of course, the myometrium is the one that does the contractions during labor and childbirth. But the endometrium is the lining where the blastocyst has to be able to implant. And the thickness of the lining gives us a sense of the female cycle and why there is uh, a uterine cycle. And so what we see here is that we're looking at the lumen of the uterus and we see that right after menses, we see that this endometrium on the left side, right after menses, is very, very thin. And you can see that it goes all the way to about there. And then right about there, we see that the myometrium begins and that's all gonna be muscle. However, on the right side, we see that the endometrium uh, will be built much, much thicker. And so all of this, all of this is gonna be endometrium, which is gonna have these folded endometrial glands right here. And this is kind of a close up view of it, but you can see it right here as well. These folds, this is where the blastocyst uh, 
will try to find a place to basically burrow itself and create a nest for pregnancy to begin. Here we have a good picture of the different layers of the uterus. You've got the perimetrium on the outside, the myometrium, and you can see how thick that is, and then finally the endometrium, which is the lining. And so again, this blastocyst will be coming in from one of the fallopian tubes and will go and try to implant itself somewhere inside that lining of that endometrium, somewhere within, if it can find an endometrial gland, it will find that and try to implant itself right there. And then you can see that these, uh, these capillaries of these arteries and, and uh, veins uh, will end up being where the nutrition comes from for this future embryo. Let's start to look at the female reproductive cycle. Non-pregnant females experience these cyclical changes in the ovaries and the uterus. So basically we have an ovarian cycle and a uterine cycle that are both taking place at the same time. The cycle involves oogenesis, which is the part that's happening inside the ovary to make the oocyte, and also the preparation of the uterus with that endometrial lining that thickens to receive the fertilized ovum. The ovarian cycle includes the changes that occur during and after the maturation of the oocyte. The uterine cycle involves the changes in the endometrium that prepare it for implantation. And all of this is going to start with gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So we're going to look at this cycle, the ovarian and the uterine cycle, in different steps, and then we're going to try to put it all together. In the first picture, we're going to look at days one through five. And down here, you can see the days, and you can see one through five. You also see that this part right here is the layer of the endometrium and the thickness of it. And what you notice is that as we go from day one to two to three, four, and five, that thickness decreases. And the reason why this decreases is because of menstrual flow. In other words, menses, menstruation, uh, the bleeding that takes place is from the endometrial lining that starts to slough off and basically uh, is going to get replaced later on in this uterine cycle. So this part down here is the uterine cycle because, of course, we are looking at the uterus. Simultaneously, what's happening in the ovaries is that starting with the hypothalamus and the gonadotropin releasing hormone, what we get are FSH and LH that go to the oocytes. And these primary follicles will start to develop into secondary follicles. And you can see that they're getting larger. You can see that corona radiata. You can see that antrum is just starting to form right there from these hormones. Now, if we look at the ovarian hormone levels at this point, they're kind of flat. You can see that estrogen is starting to go up just a little bit. And this is in, in a response to that LH that's, that is uh, going to the ovary. The, the cells that are around these follicles are going to be the ones that make that estrogen. So they'll start responding to it by making that estrogen. The follicle stimulating hormone is causing these cells to proliferate. And so estrogen levels should 
uh, continue to rise with this trend. However, notice that progesterone is pretty flat and doesn't seem to change at this point just yet. Next, we're going to look at days 6 through 12. And for day 6 through 12, what we see, and this is after we saw that uh, we had that menstrual flow, the endometrial lining begins to get thicker. So you can see that day 6, for example, is here, but then the endometrium starts to thicken, and that is what's happening in the uterine cycle. If we look at the ovarian cycle, what we see is that these secondary follicles are going to be developing more and more and are going to start getting larger. And what we see is, is that this antrum begins to develop. Now, this estrogen that comes out of these follicles with inhibin is going to go back with this dotted line and uh, cause negative feedback on the anterior pituitary and on the hypothalamus. And that's why you see these lower levels of FSH, for example, is because these, uh, these hormones are being inhibited by those high estrogen levels, which you can see right here that the estrogen levels are significantly rising. Now, at this point, progesterone is still flat, and we're going to see that progesterone will take over in, uh, in, in the future. So the next part is going to be days 13 through 14. And here what we're going to see is that, again, the endometrium is still thickening. And you can see right here uh, that we are going to get this endometrium to get thicker and thicker. In the uterine cycle, we're going to see that estrogen levels go really, really high right there, right before day 13. And this increase in estrogen above threshold ends up stimulating the hypothalamus in a way that is unexpected. Typically, if there is estrogen, the hypothalamus will be inhibited. But in this case, the opposite happens. The hypothalamus and anterior pituitary are actually going to get stimulated by this high estrogen. And this is going to cause the LH surge, which is also being shadowed by the FSH uh, levels going up as well. If we look at these levels right here, we see that LH shoots up and um, right under it is the FSH. Now it has been shown that it is the LH surge that induces ovulation. And so even though the FSH is there, it's almost there as one that's following the LH but not the primary cause of ovulation. And so this ovulation is going to take place, and um, what's going to happen is that the antrum that's filled with fluid is going to put so much pressure on that oocyte that uh, that oocyte will get ejected out into the fallopian tube. Now, the egg is ejected and is inside the fallopian tube, but if you remember the cells that are surrounding it, the ones that had the antrum inside of it, that turns into the, into the corpus uh, hemorrhagicum, which eventually also turns into this endocrine organ called the corpus luteum. Now, we call it a, uh, an endocrine-type organ because this corpus luteum starts to secrete a very large amount of progesterone. And so what you see is basically the progesterone becomes the most important hormone at this point. You can see that, in fact, it overtakes estrogen in amount, that uh, progesterone becomes the one that's in higher levels. And what progesterone does is it causes the uterine endometrium to thicken uh, significantly during this time because, of course, now that ovulation has taken place, if there are sperm, then that means that fertilization can take place, and that means that we can get a zygote and we can get a blastocyst, and then uh, we're going to be looking uh, for implantation to take place. And so you can see that the uh, 
uterine endometrium really, really thickens during that time. Now, it is very important to note that at this point, and you can see that the, uh, the progesterone levels are going down right here, this assumes that there is no implantation and therefore no pregnancy. And if there is no implantation and no pregnancy, the corpus uh, luteum turns into a corpus albicans and stops making progesterone. As progesterone levels drop, that means that uh, this endometrium will start sloughing off and you end up getting menstruation. However, let's assume that pregnancy does take place. If pregnancy does take place, then these uh, progesterone levels, instead of dropping, will actually keep on going up throughout and will stay very, very elevated throughout the pregnancy. And that corpus luteum will stick around for about six months and keep on making progesterone. And then after that point, the placenta will take over as the uh, as the organ that makes most of the progesterone to keep the pregnancy going. So this picture is all those uh, days that we kind of chopped up and we looked at individually all on one graph, and it shows you that there are about 28 days on average per cycle. Again, this is an average. It tells you that these primary oocytes at the beginning of the ovarian cycle will basically mature into these uh, graphene follicles or mature follicles, that ovulation will take place, this uh, corpus hemorrhagicum will turn into the corpus luteum, and if there's no pregnancy, that corpus luteum will turn into the corpus albicans. Simultaneously, it shows you that the uh, FSH and LH levels are, for the most part, being inhibited by estrogen, but when estrogen levels go way up, what you get is this LH surge right in the middle on day 14, and that's going to be where ovulation typically takes place, is right there on day 14. Uh, the hormones from the ovaries, it shows you that estrogen is the hormone that is in higher quantities at first and is going to go up until it hits about day 13, and then you get that LH surge, and then it starts uh, basically dropping down. And then it also shows you that the corpus luteum, which only starts to be around after day 14, will end up giving us that rise in progesterone that basically gives us that thick endometrium. And just remember that right here, that progesterone has to stay elevated if pregnancy is going to continue. But if pregnancy uh, does not take place, we get that corpus albican, so progesterone levels drop and then we end up getting menstruation and the cycle resumes. And then here we see the menstrual flow, and we see that typically days one through five have that menstrual flow, uh, followed by a thickening of the uh, endometrium. And then what we see is on day 14, once ovulation takes place, that corpus luteum makes a lot of progesterone, then that's the hormone that is able to bring that endometrial lining to a very, very uh, uh, large thickness, which allows for implantation. If there is no fertilized ovum uh, that tries to implant, what's going to happen is we lose that corpus luteum. It turns into the corpus albicans. That means we don't have the progesterone that can keep this endometrial lining thick which means we end up getting menstrual flow again at the end of this, and we start this all over again.